So welcome everybody to today's Anita um, lecture. It's with great pleasure that I welcome David Wilner, who is from the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. David is the Associate Director for Radio and Geoastronomy Division, and he's visiting Swinburne University at the moment, and it was uh, wonderful to be able to get him to give our first Anita lecture of 2014, uh, 2015, sorry, the year has progressed. Um, just want to let you know that we have a great year coming up and we'll have a lot of great speakers and we'll advertise uh, those in the meantime. Um, but until we do that, I'm going to hand over to David now and he's going to tell us, uh, give us the first of two, two lecture series. The next one will be next week. First one in radio astronomy <coughs> and interferometry interferometry fundamentals. So I'll hand it over to you, David. Great, thank you, Darren. Uh, pleased to give uh, these two lectures here as part of the uh, NIDA program. The, these, this two lecture series will be about radio astronomy and interferometry. The first lecture concentrates on uh, radio astronomy and interferometry fundamentals. Um, so this will be a general overview of radio astronomy and interferometry. And the second lecture will focus on a more detailed uh, discussion of imaging and deconvolution in radio interferometry. Um, the uh, outline of this first talk um, will be a brief introduction to radio astronomy and uh, radiation mechanisms at radio wavelengths, a discussion of single antenna uh, telescopes and synthesis array telescopes, and then uh, a more in-depth discussion of interferometry visibilities and, and Fourier transforms. So this is the outline for today's lecture. Um, my intent in, in these lectures is not uh, to be entirely rigorous, but to give you a fundamental grounding in the most important concepts in these areas and also to allow you to develop some intuition about some of the more subtle aspects, uh, particularly of interferometry. If you're looking for rigor, I'm going to give you a list of references where you can get as much rigor as you desire. So let's go into that just before we begin. I'd like to highly recommend uh, Essential Radio Astronomy. This is a complete one semester course uh, developed by Jim Condon and Scott Ransom at the National Radio Astronomy Observatories in the US. All of the course notes are online. It's very detailed, very descriptive, and, and a, just a fantastic resource. Um, for interferometry, there is a uh, reference, uh, Thompson, Moran, and Swenson called Interferometry and Synthesis in Radio Astronomy. This is a, a difficult uh, book to wade through, but if there's any topic that you're interested in and you need some fundamental derivation, it is surely in there. And so that is where you should go um, for that rigor. There are also uh, wonderful summer school lectures um, available on the web, um, in particular, the NRAO Synthesis Imaging Workshop Proceedings um, and the uh, IRAM Interferometry School Proceedings. Some of my slides, in fact, are from my own lecture at the NRAO Synthesis Workshop, and you can go there and see, uh, see more about that. And you can find many other uh, useful pedagogical uh, presentations about these topics online. The ATNF here in Australia, um, the ALMA primer, and, uh, and many others. All right, so radio astronomy. What's special about radio wavelengths? Well, I'm sure we're all familiar with the electromagnetic spectrum, light described by its wavelength, going from very short wavelengths, gamma rays, x-rays, ultraviolet, through the visible part of the spectrum to the infrared, the radio, um, and, and the very longest radio waves. So radio wavelengths kind of loosely defined are, are wavelengths from a few hundred microns um, and beyond out to many meters or frequencies from a terahertz um, or, a, or a longer. And what's special about radio wavelengths, as you can see in this chart, is that like visible light, radio waves are observable from the surface of the Earth. 
So they're very important for radio astronomy because we can build large instruments on the surface of the Earth to detect this electromagnetic radiation from cosmic sources. Um, moreover, it's a very wide spectral window. Um, it covers you know, several decades in wavelength. Uh, it's much wider than the optical, in fact. And so there are a number of uh, very important emission processes that uh, come and go in various parts of the spectrum that I'll describe in a moment. A brief bit of history, um, like most aspects of astronomy, radio astronomy was a serendipitous discovery. Carl Jansky um, was employed by the Bell Telephone Company, and he was investigating in the early 1930s uh, noise in shortwave communications across the Atlantic Ocean. And with his antenna, pictured here in New Jersey, um, he discovered uh, some noise. Um, and it was a periodic signal that he was able to locate with this rotating antenna um, to a specific um, part of the sky. He thought it might have something to do with the sun, um, but uh, after uh, discussing his discovery with an astronomer, he realized that the periodicity of his signal was not 24 hours, but 23 hours and 56 minutes, the sidereal rate. It was something that was actually fixed in the distant sky and not the sun. And it turned out to be the area of the galactic center. And this made headlines around the world. I have a little clip here from the New York Times, new radio waves traced to the center of the Milky Way. Um, direction is unchanging. And my favorite comment, its intensity is low. That's something that radio astronomers have been dealing with ever since. Um, Jansky is immortalized with a unit of flux density, 10 to the minus 26 watts per square meter per hertz. Um, and this discovery opened an entirely new window on, on cosmic sources and phenomena that are either difficult or completely impossible to detect at any other wavelengths. And so a, a real new window on the universe. Um, just as a postscript, this is all Jansky did in radio astronomy. He was then assigned to uh, other topics at Bell Labs and never returned to it. OK, so I'm going to go through a series of the most important emission mechanisms that we see at radio wavelengths. Uh, one of the most important is synchrotron radiation. So this is a, a continuum process from charged particles that spiral along magnetic field lines. So say when an electron is spiraling along a magnetic field line, it accelerates. That creates electromagnetic radiation from Maxwell's equations. And this uh, radiation tells you something about the plasma, the spectral index, that is the variation of the uh, strength of the emission with frequency, can tell you something about the distribution of the electron energies. And um, the polarization properties of the radiation can tell you something about the magnetic field direction because there's a preferred direction of the electrons uh, spiraling. Unfortunately, it looks like we lost the beautiful picture of Cygnus A on this slide which uh, is too bad. OK, um, let's go on to the next radiation mechanism, uh, Bremsstrong, uh, or breaking radiation. This is another continuum process from electrons accelerated uh, in a plasma, only this case the uh, electrons are, are encountering protons, and they're, they're being braked. And so that acceleration creates some electromagnetic radiation. This uh, beautiful picture here is a star forming region at 3.6 centimeters wavelength with a very large array. All of these little peaks here are sources of plasma ionized gas, which are being ionized by an embedded hot star, which has enough uh, ultraviolet radiation to uh, knock the electrons off the, the protons. And from the intensity of this, uh, of this emission, you can determine the mass of the ionized gas, the density of the electrons, and indeed the rate of the ionizing photons, so something about the embedded stars, which are completely invisible uh, at really any other wavelength. Another very important process, particularly at the shorter radio wavelengths, is dust emission, another continuum process where fluctuations in the charges on grains produce uh, essentially a form of, of thermal emission, a, a modified black body. This is most important in the radio for cold dust, tens to 100 Kelvin. And in this case, the emission is proportional to the dust mass times the temperature of the dust. 
So one can learn something about uh, the properties of the material and the spectrum of the dust emissivity, the change as a function of wavelength can tell you something about the grain properties, in particular, the distribution of the grain sizes. Uh, here on the right is a, a, a recent um, image of dust emission from an edge on disk around a nearby star. Uh, this is uh, sort of a Kuiper belt around the star AU Microscopy imaged in millimeter dust emission. And the left is a NASA artist conception of what the system looks like. All right. Equally, if not more important than these continuum emission processes that I've discussed are emission from spectral lines. So these are discrete low energy transitions from atoms and molecules. So um, two of the most prominent uh, spectral lines in the radio band that uh, are observed, I have illustrated on the right. One is the atomic hydrogen uh, spin flip transition at 21 centimeters, uh, very famous. You can see in this side-by-side uh, -side comparison of the M81 group that in the optical, one can see the two galaxies uh, you know, very nicely, but that in the radio in this 21 centimeter line, which is showing you the neutral hydrogen, the, uh, the galaxies show these incredible tidal tails and you can trace back how they've interacted in the future, which is very difficult, if not impossible to do um, from optical starlight alone. A second uh, molecular line that's also, a second uh, spectral line that's very important is the molecular line of carbon monoxide, CO. CO is found in regions with molecular hydrogen. Molecular hydrogen, when it's cold, has no spectral lines that emit, so it's very difficult to see, but collisions with the molecular hydrogen and CO excite the CO line, and so it's a way to trace regions of interstellar media that are molecular. And so with probes like this, one can measure things like the gas chemical composition from uh, different transitions of, of atoms and molecules, get at temperatures and densities and other physical properties. Extremely important, um, one can measure the uh, Doppler shift of these discrete transitions, which gives information about line of sight velocities and kinematics. So one actually has a, a three-dimensional view of the M81 group in the sense that there's another dimension of velocity here. And for some particular transitions, one can measure the Zeeman effect, which gives information on the magnetic field strength. Another uh, physical property that's very difficult to get at any other way. All right, I'll make a quick remark on, on units in radio astronomy, because I, I have found in my experience that people find this very confusing. Um, intensity is an often used unit. Um, uh, uh, quantity, I mean, and its units are watts per square meter, you know, energy, per steradian per hertz. So this intensity is effectively a brightness, and it's independent of source distance. So if you imagine looking at, say, the surface of the sun, if you resolve a little piece of that surface, it has some kind of intensity, and that's true no matter how far away it is. It may be uh, 5,800 degrees, no matter you know, how far away it is. Uh, radio astronomers use a kind of peculiar unit called Raleigh Jeans brightness temperature, which converts the intensity into a temperature using the Raleigh Jeans approximation. And so for thermal emission processes, this brightness temperature is just the temperature of the emitting body. So we were looking at dust emission before. Um, it might have a temperature of 10K uh, or something like that. Um, for other cases, in particular, all of those non-thermal processes I mentioned, like synchrotron emission, um, radio astronomers still talk about brightness temperature, which you can determine with this formula. Um, that's the temperature a black body would need to have to be that bright, but it doesn't correspond to any physical temperature. So that can be confusing. And then finally, the most important uh, unit is probably flux density. And this is just the integral of intensity over some solid angle. So flux density decreases with source distance squared, just as solid angle does. OK, so if you're worried about units um, and you get confused, you might refer back to this slide. All right, what about a radio telescope? So this is a very abstract view of a radio telescope on this slide, and I'll come to a more concrete example in a moment. But if you just consider a distant source that of emission, which has some 
intensity i uh, in some direction, then the power from this emission passes through some kind of sensor, some radio sensor, and that will increment um, power in the, in the sensor. It's the intensity times some differential uh, frequency and, and uh, area and solid angle, so power in watts. Um, and so the power that you collect from the intensity of this distant source is a suitable integral right, over these, uh, these uh, quantities of frequency, area, and angle. And if you want to understand what that is, then for your telescope, of course, you have to understand what the response of the telescope is in all of these areas, how much collecting area it has, what the shape of the frequency um, sensitivity is, and, and, and whatnot. So here's a real radio telescope, a very typical one. Um, this one kind of looks like an optical telescope in a way. It has a parabolic primary mirror. And that is a focusing paraboloid with high gain in some direction that um, collects all the radio waves and sends them to a, a focus. It's steerable, so it can move in two directions um, and track sources across the sky. It has a secondary mirror, which in radio astronomy is often called a subreflector, which is in front of the focus. And it sends the radio waves through the hole in the middle of the dish to a receiver that's located behind the primary, typically in a, a spacious, a relatively spacious cabin where one can put a lot of equipment. Um, this particular telescope you can see is on axis in the sense that the antenna axis is the same as the optical axis. Um, it's symmetric. It need not be that way. And the receiver in the back of this telescope is a little waveguide horn that is just a little piece of metal which effectively collects the electromagnetic radiation and sends it to an amplifier, which in this case is cryogenically cooled so that it reduces any background noise. Um, and this is kind of the general scheme of most radio telescopes, but many, many variations are possible. Um, so many variations that I don't even want to start to get into it. But I'll just describe one um, because it's kind of a fascinating one. And you may have seen it before. It's uh, currently the largest radio telescope in the world, the Arecibo Radio Telescope in Puerto Rico. This is a 300 meter diameter spherical primary. So it's not a paraboloid, which means it focuses to a line and not to a point. So that's an interesting thing to deal with at the receptor level. Um, it's made of an incredible number of perforated aluminum panels, more than 38,000 of them, and it can reflect radiation as short as a few centimeters. Now, it reflects the radiation up um, to a receiver platform, which is suspended 150 meters above the dish by cables, and that can move around to, uh, to track the source over a 40 degree cone of the sky around the zenith straight up. So you can see that you know, this has uh, got all the same elements of that abstract radio telescope that I mentioned, um, but it's a very different sort of implementation. And there are many, many other variations which don't even use dishes, but use dipoles um, on the ground and, and whatnot that uh, are, are even completely different. OK, now that's a very big telescope, but there's a big issue in radio astronomy. And that is angular resolution. So I'm sure you're all familiar with Rayleigh's criterion that um, the diffraction limit of a telescope is given by the number of wavelengths divided by the diameter of the telescope um, in units of radians. So if you think of your eye as a telescope, you're observing in the optical at, say, half a micron, and the diameter of your pupil is a couple millimeters then the resolution of your eye is something like, it's about 50 arc seconds, about one arc minute. And if you think about, say, looking at the moon with your eye, you can you know, start to resolve some small features, but they're, they're limited. If you think of a really sharp optical telescope, like the Hubble Space Telescope, it's observing at the same wavelength as your eye, half a micron. But instead of being two millimeters in diameter, it's two meters in diameter. And so it's 100 times better in resolving power down to 50 milli arc seconds. So that's really pretty good. And that's great for astronomy because a lot of things are small. Now, how about the Arecibo radio telescope? 
So suppose you're observing at six centimeters, and now the effective area that you can use that actually reflects up to the, to the receiver is something like 200 meters. The resolution of that is 60 arc seconds. It's just about the same as your eye. So um, that's about as big a radio telescope as you can imagine making, and its resolution is no better than your eye. So if you want arc second or better resolution at radio wavelengths, you need kilometer sized telescopes. And uh, that was realized early on, but it's a big challenge because it's hard to make a single telescope that's a um, kilometer or many kilometer size. And that's why synthesis telescopes came to be. Um, I should mention that the radio jargon for the, the resolution of a single element um, like, like the Arecibo telescope is the primary beam. So you'd say the primary beam size is 60 arc seconds for Arecibo. Okay, so synthesis telescopes. Well, interferometry is a technique um, to use distributed small apertures, use lots of little telescopes to synthesize a larger telescope, a larger aperture. So I have two examples here on this slide. On the left is the very large array. This is a very famous uh, radio telescope located in New Mexico in the United States. It operates at wavelengths from a few meters down to uh, a little bit less than a centimeter. And it uh, can extend to, to, uh, to, to uh, be 35 kilometers in diameter. So if you imagine you're observing at 21 centimeters, that was the wavelength of the, the hydrogen spin flip line, then you could make images with a resolution of, of 1.4 arc seconds. So now you're getting down to an interesting uh, amount of resolution, but as you can see, you need a telescope that's 35 kilometers across. That's pretty big. And the newest uh, of these synthesis telescopes, these large synthesis telescopes is ALMA, which operates in the millimeter and submillimeter part of the spectrum. It has maximum size of 15 kilometers, and at the shortest wavelengths, that's down to five milli arc seconds, actually an order of magnitude already better than the Hubble Space Telescope, if you're interested in, in certain kinds of small sources. Now, the way synthesis telescopes work is not exactly the same as the way uh, single element telescopes work, um, because obviously you're not capturing all of the same information when you only have a small fragment of the, uh, of, of the telescope um, aperture. So indeed what happens here is that you're inferring properties of the source in the sky from certain characteristics of the received electric field that are not just the intensity. Um, so this is quite a bit less intuitive than direct imaging, uh, but I want to give you a feel for that. Oh, I have one more example first. Um, the very long baseline array, this is, uh, this is a fascinating telescope. So it has a maximum size of the size of the Earth, 8,000 kilometers. And so if you're observing at a wavelength of one centimeter, now the resolution is already 0.2 milliarc seconds, which is quite incredible. Now for this to work, you can imagine, you can't actually physically connect all of these telescopes, but you can record the information at each telescope and then combine it later to uh, achieve this resolution um, and infer certain properties of the sources. All right, so now we're gonna transition and talk in more detail about interferometry. Here's our schematic two element interferometer. So you can imagine each one of these telescopes, one and two, are abstract radio telescopes that do some sort of uh, collection of the radio waves and detect them. So these telescopes are pointing at a source um, at, a, at a direction, which is labeled by this vector S0, which is at an angle theta from the zenith. And the way that the two element interferometer works is that the telescope on the left, you can see the signal gets there a little bit later than the telescope at the right. There is a time delay, which is labeled on the figure as B sine theta over C. And so what one does is one delays the signal um, from telescope two in this case, that's the tau that's listed there, and you multiply the signals and integrate them. And what you measure, and I'm sorry that my font was converted here, is something called coherence um, of the signals. So what the interferometer measures is not intensity directly, but 
coherence. We haven't really had too many equations in this talk. Here's the one slide that has an, a very important equation. All right, so what is this coherence? Um, I want to give you some feel for that. Um, there's something that radio astronomers call the visibility. It's the complex visibility function. And what this is, effectively, is the two-dimensional Fourier transform of what the emission is on the sky. And if you want a derivation of where this comes from for the two-element interferometer, one can look at that, uh, that reference I mentioned, Thompson, Moran, um, and Swenson in chapter 14. There are a few different ways one can derive this. Uh, I think this is one of the more transparent ones, but it still takes several pages of equations, and so I'm not going to go into that for this talk. Um, there are limitations as to when this applies and when it doesn't. Um, but if you look at the figure on the right, this, this describes the basic geometry, and I can explain the equation that comes on the left uh, mathematically. So our two element interferometer there is on the ground. And there are two coordinates, u and v. u points east and v points north. And you measure the separation of these telescopes on the ground in terms of number of wavelengths in u and v. So they're the east, west, and north, south spatial frequencies, they're called, measured in wavelengths on the ground. Then if you go to the sky plane, there's uh, an intensity distribution, which is called TLM on this figure. Now, L and M are angles on the sky. And so they're the east, west, and north, south angles in the plane that's tangent to the curved sky. Now, what is this visibility? So this visibility as a function of u and v on the ground is this double integral of TLM on the sky times this exponential factor e to the 2 pi i ul plus vm, then integrated over these angles. So if you remember, this e to the 2 pi i times these other factors is just a series of sines and cosines. e to the ix is cos x plus i sine x. I'm sure you remember that. So this visibility is the sky brightness multiplied by a bunch of sines and cosines and then integrated. And what that actually is in detail is a two-dimensional Fourier transform. And at the bottom of the, the slide, I have a, a shorthand notation for this equation that VUV is this Fourier transform, that little arrow with the F of TLM. And one of the properties of the Fourier transform that I'll describe in a moment is that it also works the other way. The sky brightness distribution is the Fourier transform of the visibilities. So this interferometer is measuring coherence. It's measuring the visibility function. And so for a particular separation of antennas at a point U and V, one gets some measure of the Fourier transform of the sky brightness TLM. All right. So you can see Fourier transforms are important. So I want to spend a few minutes discussing in more detail the Fourier transform. So I'm sure some of you know everything about Fourier transforms. Some of you may know nothing. So hopefully for those that know something, this will be a good review. Um, basically, Fourier, Fourier theory states that any well-behaved signal, that includes images, um, can be expressed as the sum of sinusoids. And here's a picture of, of our hero, Jean-Baptiste Joseph Fourier, Frenchman from the 18th century. So if you imagine a, a signal like a square wave, um, you can represent a square wave, kind of, by four sinusoids. If you sum them up appropriately, you get something that kind of looks like a square wave. And in fact, you may know from your Fourier analysis classes that you can approximate the square wave by an infinite number of uh, sine waves. It's just that to get those sharp edges, you need a lot of little tiny waves, so you need a lot of terms in your function. But the Fourier transform at its heart is just a mathematical tool that decomposes a signal, any signal, into a sinusoidal components. And what's important to remember is that the Fourier transform of a function, of a signal, contains all of the information of the original signal. So if you, if you know the Fourier transform, then you actually know the original. OK. So if you want to do 
radio astronomy and in particular interferometry, you really want to acquire some comfort with the Fourier domain. If you look at old textbooks, um, functions in their Fourier transforms are said to occupy upper and lower domains as if, and this quote is from Bracewell, one of my favorites, functions circulated at ground level and their transforms in the underworld. And you can decide whether it's the visibility or the sky brightness that's in the underworld at the end of the lecture. So some properties of the Fourier transform are that um, it's linear. So I've written here the small g is the Fourier transform of the large g. So if you have two functions, say g and h, if you add those two functions together and get a new function, the Fourier transform is just the addition of the Fourier transform of the individual functions. So they simply add, so that's useful. There's also a scaling property. If you multiply the coordinate by some, some value, alpha here, you scale it, then the Fourier transform is also scaled, but by the inverse of that alpha. There's a shift theorem. If you shift the coordinate, then you just add a phase term to the Fourier transform. You just change the phase of the sinusoids. And there is a convolution multiplication theorem. That is, if a function is the convolution of two functions, then its Fourier transform is the product of, those, of the Fourier transforms of those functions. And finally, I'll just mention uh, one version of the sampling theorem. If you have a function that's restricted to a domain, say theta, it's completely determined if the Fourier transform is sampled at intervals of one over theta. So you don't need to sample every part of, of it. You just need to, to satisfy the sampling theorem to completely determine the function. So those are all mathematical properties of the Fourier transform that are useful to keep in mind. And in some examples that, that are coming up, you'll see how these, uh, how these come into play. OK, another word about visibilities. Um, as I mentioned, uh, each visibility, so at some UV point, contains information on the sky brightness everywhere, right? Because, because of the sinusoidal nature of the, uh, of the phase term, um, each point in the UV plane, as it's called, um, in the visibility domain, has information on the sky brightness everywhere in that domain, right? Not just at one place in, in, in the sky brightness distribution or within a particular region, but everywhere. The other thing is that you remember the I, each visibility is a complex quantity. So it's often expressed as a real and imaginary part, um, as a real part and an imaginary part, or as an amplitude and a phase. Either one works. So here's an example of a Fourier transform of an image. We have here an astronomer you know, represented as sky brightness, T of LM. If you Fourier transform that image, you get information visibility at a whole bunch of UV points, you have amplitude, and you have phase. So you see that's uh, one way to do it. Or it could be real and imaginary. In this case, we've chosen to use amplitude and phase. So I'm going to go through a few examples of, of Fourier transforms to give you a little more intuition about them. Um, a delta function is kind of the narrowest uh, function you can have. So if you imagine sky brightness that's really peaky, a delta function, if you Fourier transform it, it's a constant, right? It has the same visibility amplitude everywhere. A Gaussian um, transforms into a Gaussian, and a narrow Gaussian transforms into a wide Gaussian. So narrow features transform into wide features and vice versa. So if you see something that's narrow in one domain, it's going to be broad in the other domain. So here's an elliptical Gaussian. You can see it's uh, narrow in one dimension and broad in the other. And if you look at its Fourier transform, it's broad in the opposite dimension and narrow in the other. OK, here's a uniform disk. When you Fourier transform that, you get a Bessel function. So Hopefully, you can see the series of uh, rings that come around from the Bessel function. And you know, what does this mean? 
the, uh, the disk has a sharp edge, right? And so if you want to represent that sharp edge, it means you need a lot of high spatial frequencies. You need values um, in the Fourier transform out at large u and v in order to represent that sharp edge. So this is analogous to that square wave that I showed you earlier. Um, if you really want to get the sharp edge, then you need, excuse me, you need uh, all of, of, of the uh, visibility plane. Here's another example. You might think about well, what's the Fourier transform of this look like? Um, think about that for a minute. Here's the answer. It looks a lot like the Bessel function above. So why is that? That's because the spatial frequencies you need to make three disks are pretty much the same as the spatial frequencies you need to make one. And it's the phase information that I'm not showing here that's telling you where that stuff is located. So this is, um, I think, perhaps the biggest trap in Fourier transforms and radio interferometry is understanding the, the nature of amplitude and phase and so try to give you a little bit of an example here. Amplitude tells you how much of a certain spatial frequency you need. So here's our, our little Gaussian on the left. It Fourier transforms into a big Gaussian, and the phase is constant. Why is the phase constant? It's telling you where these spatial frequencies are located. Our little Gaussian is in the center of this image. And so the phase information is kind of not, not very interesting. If I shift the, the source over a little bit away from the center, then the amplitude of the visibility are exactly the same, right? You need the same sine waves to make the small Gaussian, whether it's shifted or not, but the phase is different. Oh, great. And unfortunately, the slide isn't showing that, but you can imagine that the phase is different. And if I were to move the source in a different direction and do the Fourier transform again, the amplitudes are the same and the phase that you can't see is different. Okay, I'll have to fix that. All right, so let's review a little bit this concept of visibilities. Um, this is the one equation, remember, the visibility as a function of u and v, so those are spatial frequencies on the ground measured in wavelengths, is this double integral over sine waves of the sky brightness distribution. Um, where L and M are, are angles on the sky. So there are a few things to notice. One is if you put zero in for U and V, right? So you're at the origin of the UV plane, then what you get is just the integral of the sky brightness distribution. And in radio astronomy, that's just the total flux density. So the visibility right at the center of the UV plane is just the total flux density. Another thing to notice is that um, because sky brightness is real, right? It's not imaginary. Um, if you put in minus u and minus v, then you get the conjugate version of v u v. So v, the visibility, is said to be mathematically Hermitian, and that means you get two visibilities for one measurement. That is, if you make a measurement at u and v, you also get the answer at minus u minus v. So that's uh, convenient for radio astronomy. All right, so now this little illustration is to kind of show you what this equation means. So I've said it in words a number of times, I'll say it again. The visibility is the sky brightness multiplied by a bunch of sound wave, sine waves and then integrated. So this little smiley face here is going to be our sky brightness distribution, our T of LM. Now, if we have an interferometer, then it effectively puts a sine wave on the sky, a fringe pattern as it's called, and it multiplies the sky brightness distribution by this fringe pattern. So you can see the pattern of, of light and dark is plus and minus of the sine wave. And so you do this multiplication and you get a number and that's the visibility. So that's all there is to it. If we separate our antennas a little farther on the ground, then we get a different set of sine waves. We get a higher spatial frequency, right? Because in this case, we've made U bigger, so we have a faster sine wave. And you can see if you multiply this sine wave by the little smiley face, you get a number. 
And in fact, that number is essentially the same as the number from the previous set of antennas, right? And then if we do it again, this time we turn the antennas um, a little bit. So we have a, an angle now. Now the fringe pattern is rotated. And if we do the same multiplication of the sky brightness by the sine wave, we get a number. Again, it's almost the same number, if not exactly the same number. So what is that telling you? That means any separation of the antennas is giving you the same visibility. That's telling you that the source is small, right? That it's a point source. Remember the Fourier transform of a delta function is a constant. And so this is telling you that there's not much information besides that the source is smaller than the resolution of your antenna baselines. So by contrast, here's a bigger source, another happy source, a bigger one. If we start with the antennas close together, we get the broad sine wave. If we do this multiplication, you can see we get a number, but you can see part of the source is, is on the negative part of the wave, and part of it's on the positive part, and part of it's on the negative part. So if we do this multiplication and integrate, then we get a number which is smaller than the total flux. That's to say the source is resolved. If we move the antennas farther apart and we do the same exercise, now we have a bunch of sine waves across the source. So we do the multiplication and we get a number that's now you know, probably pretty small, except for the little variations on the source, like the eyes and the smile. And if we turn uh, to a different baseline and we do this exercise again, we're gonna get a different number. And a lot of the difference in this case is going to be due to the fact that there's this small scale structure on the source, the eyes and the mouth. And so, that's the name of the game here, is that if you can make enough different measurements of the visibility, then you can learn about the structure of the sky brightness. If you made enough different antenna pair measurements, then you could reconstruct the information that you have a smiley face on the sky. So that's aperture synthesis, right? The basic idea is to sample the visibility function at enough UV points using these distributed small aperture antennas to synthesize the resolution of a large aperture, which goes out to the maximum U and V that you can measure. And as I said, one pair of antennas, one baseline gives you two samples because the visibility is permission at a time. So two samples is not very many. If you wanna build up all that information, if you had to do it one pair of antennas at a time, it would be pretty painful. Um, so if you have any antennas, well, then you have n times n minus 1 pairs. So you get n times n minus 1 samples at a time. And if you're really clever, you'll note that the Earth is turning, whether you want it to or not. And so your U and V on the ground are changing, whether you want them or not, for fixed antennas. And so Earth rotation actually tends to fill in the UV plane um, no matter what you do. And in fact, the, uh, the realization that one could take advantage of this and make aperture synthesis uh, measurements um, using a number of antennas and Earth rotation was a big part of the, the 1974 Nobel Prize in Physics. Uh, Sir Martin Ryle, uh, British, uh, had to balance the, the French from earlier, um, 1974. So, if you only have any antennas, then you probably have to move them around to get more samples. That is, you can reconfigure their physical layout. And another thing you can do, if your source emission is the same at a bunch of wavelengths, which you know maybe it is, maybe it isn't, you'd have to know, um, you can observe at multiple wavelengths at once um, because Remember, U and V are measured in wavelengths. So if you were measure, if you were observing at multiple wavelengths, you can cover different parts of the UV plane at the same time. And so this is called multi-frequency synthesis. But it, it only works if you understand the source spectrum and you can characterize it. Now, if your source is varying while you're making different measurements of U and V of visibility, um, then you're in trouble in terms of aperture synthesis. So one of the assumptions is that while you're collecting all these samples of the Fourier transform, the source isn't changing. 
Here are a few examples of uh, aperture synthesis telescopes, in particular ones that, that work at millimeter wavelengths. I already showed you the VLA and, and ALMA here on the left. One of my favorite telescopes is the submillimeter array that our institution helped build up on Mauna Kea. Um, the Australia Telescope Compact Array is a, a synthesis telescope, the Iron Plata de Burr interferometer, and uh, the Karma Array in California. You can see they're all different configurations of, of multiple antennas, all of which can be moved around to collect visibilities and ultimately to make images of celestial objects. All right. So let me give you a concrete example of UV sampling. This is from the submillimeter array. So this uh, picture here on the left are the 24 stations that one can put each of the eight antennas of the SMA. Um, in this case, we're only using six of them at a frequency of 345 gigahertz at a declination of 22 degrees. And we put those six antennas in those places. And if we let the Earth turn, then this is the sampling of the UV plane that one gets out of this particular configuration for this source at this frequency. So you can see the span is about a thousand kilo lambda, a thousand thousand wavelengths, and in both uh, U and V. And uh, what else to say about this? There are lots of little gaps in these elliptical tracks. That's when you're not looking at the target source of interest, but you're looking at a calibrator. Um, and there are some longer gaps maybe when something went wrong. You could then move the antennas around. So here's seven antennas of, of the array at different stations. And the UV coverage looks like this. So now the antennas are closer together, so U and V are smaller. And then here's uh, another configuration. Seven antennas move into an even more compact configuration. And that's the coverage you get out of that. And then you can combine them all, right? And these three observations, each of which runs for some eight hours, gives you this coverage of the UV plane. So all of these different samples of the Fourier transform of the source that we were interested in. So what are the implications of this kind of coverage, right? The samples of the visibility function are limited entirely by the number of antennas you're using and by the geometry of the Earth and the target position in the sky. So one typically has a UV coverage like this in the sense that the properties are there's an outer boundary. So there's no information on size scales that are smaller than what's sampled by the outer boundary. So this corresponds to the resolution limit. So this is you know, the size of our telescope. It's um, 500,000 wavelengths in, in every direction. Interferometry also usually ends up with an inner hole right in the center there of the UV coverage that you can only put the antennas so close together of an interferometer. So that means there's no information on larger scales than that. And extended structures that are too big are completely invisible. That's not something that we tend to have a lot of intuition about, um, but it's a very important feature. And then in between this inner hole and the outer boundary, we have irregular coverage based on where we could put the antennas and, and where, you know, how the Earth was rotating, where the source was in the sky. And so typically the sampling theorem is violated and information is missing. So all this sounds terrible, um, but it's not so bad. And the imaging and deconvolution lecture will talk about well how you can recover from some of these problems. Just to give you a little more intuition about these two issues, here's our, our Fourier transform of an astronomer again. Remember the amplitude and phase. If we were to um, get rid of all the high spatial frequencies, right, just apply this mask, and so we only measured the ones in the middle there, then we just get a blurry version of the astronomer, right? Our resolution is limited. Um, so just like observing with a small telescope instead of a big one, or with your eyeball instead of the Hubble Space Telescope, things are blurrier. But the opposite is also true. If we were to lose the low spatial frequencies, the ones in the middle, the Fourier transform of that is a highly spatially filtered version of the astronomer, right? We only see the edges, um, right? The, the total flux is gone because that was in the middle, right? Total flux density gone. 
but you pick up all the small scale features. So maybe like the, uh, the smiley face in my example, but in this case, an astronomer's smiley face. So Fourier transforms are great. They're fundamental to interferometry. And if you're not familiar with XKCD, I, I hope you will be. You can take a look at this cartoon at your leisure. Um, but if you accidentally Fourier transform your cat, you're in trouble. And to summarize, uh, what have I talked about today? I've talked a little bit about radio astronomy. The things to remember are that radio wavelengths from a few hundred microns to tens of meters reach the ground. Um, there are many different kinds of celestial sources and radiation mechanisms in this wavelength range, uh, including I described synchrotron, bremsstrong, dust emission, atomic and molecular spectral lines, and all these give windows on the universe that are not available, say, in the optical, which is the only other wavelength regime that reaches the ground. And if you want high angular resolution at radio wavelengths, well, then you need interferometry. And what interferometry does is it samples visibilities that are related to the sky brightness by the Fourier transform. And I encourage you to acquire some comfort with the Fourier domain so that you can learn a little bit more about interferometry. And that'll be the subject of lecture two um, coming up. Thank you. OK, so Darren here again. I just want to say once more thanks to David for giving this lecture. Um, we're following up next week with a second one on imaging and deconvolution uh, in radio interferometry. That will be slightly more advanced, but still contain a lot of great material for students and people working in this field to use as a reference, or if you just want to bring yourself back up to speed. So watch out for that. For people who are watching this uh, on YouTube um, in the future, just click through to that next lecture. It will be available. Um, and just to emphasize that all the Anita lectures go online and they're available to you to watch um, at your leisure and to direct your students or colleagues towards. So go to the Anita webpage and you can find the links to that. And I encourage you to do so. One of the reasons why we're hosting, or one of the main reasons we're hosting these lectures is so that we can build up a resource um, that can be used by students and professional astronomers and interested amateur astronomers. So with that, thanks again. David and we'll call this I'll call this lecture to a close. Thank you very much for listening in.